It's pretty normal these days for engineers to re review each other's code. One of the things that usually goes along with that is a style guide that says, for example, curly braces go here, we break lines here, we name methods and uh, variables in certain ways, okay? Um, all of this is very good. I, and I have an idea here, which is that I think we should add contracts and some ideas around contracts to those uh, code reviews. I think it would make them way more uh, helpful. Uh, at least that's been my experience. So let's take a look and see how contracts can be helpful during code reviews. Let me click on the right window again. There we go. Um, so the benefits of the code reviews in general are quality. I mean, the intent is to perhaps catch bugs that other people have accidentally put in the code. Communication, that is to share what's going on so at least one other person knows what's going on. Uh, clarity, and that is you say, I wrote this, and you ask the other person, does it make sense to you? Uh, get feedback, uh, and you say like, hey, I'm thinking about making a change to the system that looks like this. What do you think of that? Or do you have any other ideas? There's a, an aspect of norming where a team uh, over time develops its own sense of style. And the final one here is education. That is that uh, uh, so more experienced team members may share advice or direct attention to certain parts of the code. So all of these are pretty good. I think what many people think is, uh, is the main driver for code reviews is quality, that very first one about catching the bugs. Uh, you know, it turns out that it's hard to catch some bugs, right? And uh, the person who's been writing the code all day is uh, in a much better position to catch those bugs than the person who's spending 10 minutes reviewing the code. Um, on the other hand, if you uh, write code in a stylized way, it may some of those errors may pop out, may be easier to catch in advance. That's where contracts come in. So coding style is important, uh, and the code reviews do help enforce a consistent coding style. Uh, rather than saying there is one correct coding style, you can think of it a different way. That when you have a group of people, it's really helpful just to agree on a single coding style, even if it's not perfect, or that is, even if it's not your favorite coding style. A lot of the rules of coding style can be automated. For example, you may auto format a whole bunch of code. So again, the line breaks in the uh, variable naming uh, may become consistent and so forth. I still think that while code standards are important, they're not terribly interesting. I mean, that is, I, I don't want them to go away. I appreciate the benefits of them. But if I really wanted to, I could write some pretty terrible code that matches the style guide, okay? And I do end up seeing code that matches the style guide that isn't awesome. It is possible to, to do that, especially early career folks. And what I'd really like to do is I'd like to drive my own code to be better, and I want to drive the rest of the team's code to be better. And the style guide doesn't really help with that. It doesn't really necessarily make code easier to understand. I mean, it avoids the superficial confusion of different formatting. Um, it, uh, I want code that has a simple design and, you know, things like variable naming and where the curly brackets go doesn't really uh, affect the design. And I want code that works really well. And uh, again, the, the style guide stuff just categorically doesn't address that very much. So here's what I suggest. I think that if you take uh, the idea of contract-based programming and combine it with code reviews, that you end up in a really good place. What you have to do to do this is the entire team has to agree that they're going to do it. That is, they're going to use contracts in their code. I think you're going to find that if only one or two people on your team try to do it on their own, uh, they're going to be very frustrated. Uh, they're going to write some code or they're going to suggest something. And if the other people don't agree with that, don't agree with, say, putting comments on the code that represent the contracts, uh, their voices are going to be drowned out. And uh, even if those people write code that they're very happy with, they're going to find people who may come in and edit it later on and diminish the benefits, maybe not even update the contract if the implementation changes. So um, what we really want to be able to do here is we want the reviewers in code review to be able to help the person who wrote the code find a better way to hit their goal. So we have to agree what that goal is. So when the team agrees that they're going to shoot for the goal of having clear contracts on everything, it reduces some of the subjectivity of, hey, I thought of a different way to build it that I like better. And it moves it more towards, you know, have you done these things that are good for contractual purposes? And your hope is that over time, by having those good contracts, uh, that is a, an invisible hand that pushes us towards 
uh, simpler designs and, and, and cleaner designs. So here's a, a list of uh, rules that I've tried in code reviews. Uh, each one of these things can be, uh, I can point back to some particular problem that we had, and uh, that's why we went in here. So let me, I'm not gonna read through them, but sort of go over them briefly. Uh, the first two talk about what's true before and after. That's just stating in words preconditions and postconditions, okay? So saying what must be true as opposed to saying the activities that happen in the implementation. Uh, using declarative language is another way of getting at that, so avoiding the action verbs. You want to omit the implementation choices. I think that's hitting uh, things over the head because if you internalize the idea of contracts, you're obviously going to uh, omit the implementation choices. One way people sometimes slip up, though, is they say this code, like the contract for it, it does this and then this and then this. And so uh, putting that uh, language in about sequence helps you avoid uh, the and then problem. So um, we've chatted in another lecture here about uh, total functions, and that's what this next one is dealing with. Uh, it says, if you're not gonna be total, if you say like, I only operate on a subset of the strings, right? Uh, then say what that is, and you know, you, you would wanna try to say, how does the caller know which strings you're gonna be able to respond to, for example? Um, obviously you wanna handle things like nulls, uh, and you wanna talk about what exceptions you might throw, or, or the other kinds of failures you're gonna have. Side effects are another good one to chat about. Um, and an, an overall goal of having contracts is that you want to make sure that the caller can avoid reading the implementation. So number nine just states that straight up. And it says, you know, in any way, like if your contract is too sketchy or too vague or anything else, and you find as the reviewer that you're tempted to read the implementation in order to figure out the contract, you can point at that. Um, the, the number 10 is just really saying, again, if you internalize what invariants are all about, it's factoring all those invariants out of uh, the pre and post conditions that would otherwise appear. Uh, in general, you want simpler contracts over more complicated ones. This is where the invisible hand of uh, contracts starts to push quality because uh, you get simple contracts, code becomes easier to understand, easier to use, fewer bugs, so forth, easier to test. Um, you can omit contracts in some cases. And if you don't have this rule in there, people are gonna rebel, I think, uh, because they're gonna say like, I don't need to have a contract on is empty. Well, I, I might say, look, it's only one line, but uh, for the sake of harmony on the team, you can uh, leave some of these things off. Uh, aligning the contract with the contours of the problem is a little bit tricky. Uh, you're gonna find that uh, when you do line up uh, the contract with the contours of the problem, uh, the contracts become simpler. And so this is a way of sort of, again, invisible hand pushing it towards that. Uh, the last one is a personal style preference that, that I like. Uh, I find that when you think about each method as being either a predicate, a query, or a command, that is, uh, is it something that's going to return true or false? Is it something that is going to uh, return, um, that, that, that does not mutate the data? Those are the predicates and then the queries. Separating those from commands, which are mutation operations, uh, has a real big effect on the code. And if at any given point you can identify which one of those three a given method is, uh, it becomes a lot easier to deal with it. So the purpose of all these rules is to streamline a code review. You want everyone to agree these are clear rules in advance so that when disagreements invariably happen, you can look at these rules, they're easy to interpret, and you can just go straight for it. Now, you're gonna probably have to tweak these rules for yourself. Uh, and what you're gonna watch out for is you don't wanna see people gaming the system or checking the box of like, all right, all right, all right, there's the end. What you really want them to do is you want them to buy in and say, yeah, we agree that this, uh, these set of rules are helping us. They are guiding the system in a good direction. So what should you expect if, if all that goes well? Well, first is that almost all your methods would actually have contracts on them. Uh, many of those contracts are very terse because you hope that you're driving simplicity. So return true if and only if the balance is less than 100. I mean, that's uh, dead simple. People should be able to understand that um, and wouldn't be tempted, tempted to read the implementation. You should be starting to notice more and more separation between interfaces and implementations because uh, with contracts, it's, it's much clearer what the interface is and uh, people are encouraged to, to keep the two separated. Uh, the idea of pure functions uh, with, with, and things that are pure functions and methods that have side effects are hopefully separated inside the code because as you uh, separate them, you find it easier to write those contracts and easier to test. A bunch of pitfalls just go away in your code or at least greatly reduced. You know, like 
A null goes in some place where the author of the code didn't expect, uh, or the caller of something didn't realize there was a, a side effect to calling this code. Uh, the co contracts can make these things apparent and maybe even drive them out of your code, or at least reduce the, the, the likelihood. And the callers can handle and avoid error cases, right? Because uh, they're calling your method and the contract clearly says how to interpret the results. At the end of the day, what you're really looking for is a combination of logical and procedural thinking, where you're doing the procedural thinking inside the method and saying, does this method add up to the, the uh, post condition that I have to uh, s satisfy? And you use logical thinking to add everything together, right? Uh, different methods I mean, as you jam them together. So in industry, uh, there's a need to balance ideals of like we can do better and pragmatism of like, you know, that's really expensive and that might not work. So things like proving code correct has been mostly been much too expensive for industry. There are there are some counter examples, uh, proofs inside of uh, chip design and in terms of static analysis through code uh, for, for little properties like does null ever flow into this variable before I dereference it? Those things have been a big win. Those things definitely are pragmatic. But bigger proofs uh, have, have been slow to adopt, okay? Uh, a lot of times people conflate the idea of I'm uh, a big fan of contracts with I must like proofs, and that's not the case. Or at least I don't encourage people to use them. On the flip side, cowboy hacking leads to a big mess. And I think this is generally well recognized that uh, you do need to search for uh, ways of making your code high quality. Um, but how exactly do we do that? I think that contracts are a great reasonable compromise between the two. Uh, it's asking people to engage the kinds of thinking that would go into proving the code correct or to driving simplicity in the code. But at the end of the day, you have an escape hatch. I mean, at the end of the day, you can just state uh, in the contract the way the code uh, works. You're not forced to do anything. You just have to write down the way it works. And once you write down the way it works, people will understand and can use it. So in summary, code reviews have become the, the norm inside of a lot of big tech companies. Uh, they generally have coding standards. They have something called a style guide, which says exactly how you write the code. And I think that contracts would just make a great addition to this. I've had uh, great experiences using these things. It's a single idea the whole team can get behind, and it acts as this invisible hand that uh, will actually drive code quality in a way that uh, simple style guides will not. And what's more, it's pragmatic. I think that uh, if you um, adopt this, you're not going to find that it's heavyweight and difficult to use. In fact, after doing a little bit, you're going to find it pretty darn easy.